Hello. If you're listening to this, it sounds like you've survived Lesson 1.1 and you're into practice, so let's have a look at what just happened. The new formula that we've introduced that we're going to be using a fair bit is about how much energy it takes to heat up or cool down a piece of material. And the formula they give for it is that the total energy equals the mass of the thing you're heating or cooling times the specific heat of the thing you're heating or cooling times how much did you heat or cool it. And multiplying those three to give, together will give you a total amount of energy. So this first amount here is the total energy, or in chemistry we use the term enthalpy to mean chemical energy. And I use the symbol, I use kind of a, a Greek E for it as the symbol for energy, but in other places you will see Q, which is for quantity of energy, or sometimes you'll see an H for heat, or any number of other symbols can go there. It doesn't really matter what letter is there. What's important is that you know that means the total energy involved. And the other amounts here are the mass of the material whose temperature is changing its specific heat, and delta T, delta is a Greek letter, and in, in science it normally means the change in something. So this means the change in temperature. If you go from 100 degrees to 102 degrees, the delta T is plus 2. Temperature went up by 2 degrees. Now, the units for these are kind of a big deal. Total enthalpy is normally measured in joules. Metric unit for energy is the joule. Mass in chemistry is usually grams, although you could go with kilograms if you had to. Change in temperature will generally be in Celsius degrees. And the specific heat there are two possibilities. Generally, we will give specific heat with the units of joules per gram degree Celsius. If you get these units, you're committing to your energy being in joules and your mass being in grams. These three units have to work together. You have to have joules and grams and joules per gram degree. The alternative, if you don't want to do that, is you can use your specific heat in kilojoules per kilogram degree Celsius. So this unit's a thousand times bigger and this unit's a thousand times bigger. If you do that, then your energies are going to come out in kilojoules and your masses are going to have to be in kilograms. In chemistry, especially lab chemistry, where we're usually working with fairly small amounts of material, it's more common to use joules and grams, but if you work with chemicals by the truckload, you might get used to working in kilojoules and kilograms to handle those bigger numbers. So, just one more thing before we go on with this. A lot of the examples that we do are going to involve heating or cooling water, and so the specific heat for water is a number you're going to work with a lot. And normally we'll just put like C with a little subscript saying what chemical it's for. The specific heat for water is often said to be 4.19. That's the number I have in my head. So 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius, or if you prefer, 4.19 <coughs> kilojoules per kilogram degree Celsius. But if you look in other places, you will find other numbers like 4.186, 4.184 even. And the reason for that is it changes with temperature. Here is a list that I found online. This is a site called Engineering Toolbox. And what it's giving here is, here are temperatures over on the left side. And this column here is the specific heat of water at each of those temperatures. When water has just thawed from ice, when it's just a hundredth of a degree above freezing, its specific heat is 4.2, or a little higher. At 4 degrees, it's down to 4.205, and it drops at 10 degrees it's 4.19, then it gets down to 4.18, continues to drop until you get to about body temperature, and then it starts rising again. And 
water that's just about to boil is back up above 4.2. So the honest truth is the specific heat of water depends very much on how hot it is, and we use 4.19 as just a ballpark number for water that we encounter a lot. Most water that comes out of a tap is a little cool, it's probably a little under 20 degrees, so these numbers around 4.19 are pretty realistic. If you had a very finicky problem where you had to be very precise about your amount of energy, you would have to go to a site like this and make sure you were picking out an appropriate number for your specific heat. But for now, typically, I'm going to use 4.19, and every so often in the book they're going to use, I think, 4.184, and we'll work around that when we get to it. As long as your procedure is right here, that's the important thing, and we'll try not to stress you out too much about the details of the specific heat. So, let's get an example up here and see how this formula actually works. Okay, I said an example, I meant three. Let's, there's two here and there's one more I can scroll on to in a moment. So, reminder, our formula is the total energy for something temperature-like to happen equals the mass of the material times the specific heat of the material times the temperature change for the material. And they say here, how much energy is needed to heat enough water to make a cup of tea, 250 milliliters. If the water is initially at 20 degrees, and you want to get it up to a rather painful 85, that sounds way too hot, assuming that one milliliter of water has a mass of one gram. Okay, so we're finding the total energy. We don't know how much that is right now. For our mass, this is a very common fudge we use that's built into the metric system, and it's lovely. In metric, water, one milliliter of water has a mass of one gram, pretty much exactly. So 250 mils of water is the same as 250 grams of water. They actually did that on purpose to make life easy for chemists and physicists, and it's great. So our mass is 250 grams. The specific heat of water is, I'm going to go with my 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius. And the temperature change, we started at 20, we're ending up at 85, so we're going up by 65 degrees. The, t the delta T is 65. If you need to calculate it, generally delta T is, they'll write, T final minus T initial, meaning the temperature you end up at minus the temperature you started at. So in this case, you'd be doing 85 minus 20, and that would give you your 65 degrees. We fudge the order of this sometimes more about that later, but for now, 65 is good. So when we multiply this out on the calculator, you're doing 250 times 4.19 times 65 degrees, and I get... What is that? 68,000... 87.5. And what units does this have again? I hope you remember that energy is measured in joules, and so the unit here should be joules. If you ever forget that, these other units can help you out. When we multiply these things, grams here cancel grams, degrees Celsius cancel degrees Celsius, and look at that, the only unit that remains is joules. So you can give that as 68,087.5 joules, or because a thousand joules make a kilojoule, you could divide all this by a thousand and get 68.0875 kilojoules. And let's give specific or significant digits their due here. This number has three significant digits. The temperature change should have had three. I should have written 65.0 here. And uh, 4.19 also has three sig digs, so we should be trimming this off at 68 point, not zero. You look at this place, and because this is five or more, you round up 68.1 kilojoules. That's how much energy you would have to pump into that water to heat it up from 20 to 85. Good. Let's see if we can get through a couple more a little faster. I'm trying to show all the detail, but I'll also try not to put you to sleep by obsessively explaining everything. Okay, same formula here. Energy equals mc delta t. 
Okay, now as the tea sits there, so we got it up to 85, and now they say it's going to cool from 85 to 75 as it sits. And again, how much energy? So the energy released as it cools would be, its mass is still 250 grams. The specific heat is still 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius. The temperature changes from 85 down to 75, 10 degrees. I just cheated there a little bit, did you notice? If you rigorously do the delta T, if you do T final minus T initial, you would do the final temperature is 75, because that's where you end up, minus 85 is where you started, that's the initial temperature. The delta T should be minus 10, and I completely ag agree with that. However, in this formula, the negative sign doesn't do you any good if you put it in here, and so I will typically cheat and just not include it. Negative energy is not a critical thing to get out of this equation. What we want is the number, and for the number, all we really need is how big is the temperature change, not necessarily whether it's positive or negative. So I hope you will forgive me if I skip that negative, and if you do that too, it shouldn't cause you any trouble. We'll talk in a little while about the small price you do have to pay for leaving off that negative. We'll go get to that in a moment. So. Your energy here will be 250, again, times 4.19, again, times 10 degrees. I get 10,475 joules, or if you like, 10.475 kilojoules. And uh, I guess, again, everything has three sig digs, so 10.5 kilojoules would be the correct way to answer that. Now, is energy being gained or lost by this? In other words, is energy flowing into the T or out of the T as this happens? That's the important thing to get right when you're giving an energy answer. In this first example, we were heating T up, and to do that, you have to put energy into it. You're adding thermal energy, and that's why the temperature rises. You're making the particles vibrate faster. So in this question, 68.1 kilojoules had to be put into the water. Now the water is cooling down, which means it's losing energy. So this would be 10.5 kilojoules lost from the water. Where is it going? Out into the surroundings, mostly. There's steam floating off the surface of the cup. The cup's getting hot. If there's a saucer or a table under the cup, then that's getting hot. If you're holding it, then your hands are getting hot, and that may start to hurt. But when something is cooling, it's releasing thermal energy into its surroundings, and in some of our questions, we will ask you not only how much energy, but in what direction is it going. Is it going into the liquid, or is it coming back out of the liquid? In this case, it's lost from the water out into the surroundings. All right, let's see one more with a bit of a twist. Okay, different, we're not doing tea anymore. This is a different amount of water, and it's more, but the same formula can still help us. Energy equals mc delta t. Now they're telling us the total amount of energy used was 100 kilojoules. 100,000 joules equals, the mass of water is 500 grams, uh, the specific heat for water, I will go with 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius. And we don't know the temperature change. That's what they're asking for. What is the temperature change of the water? So we'll see how much we can heat up water if we use 100,000 joules on it. So how do we solve this? You can multiply the 500 and the 419, combine those. 100,000 equals, I almost feel like I could do that in my head, but let's not take chances, 2,095 delta T. Thinking back to math class, if you want to isolate delta T and it's multiplied by 2,095, you divide both sides by 2,095 
da, 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 da. the 2095s cancel out and we get delta t equals 100,000 divided by 2095 and I get 47.7326969 degrees Celsius. So I don't know how hot that water was to begin with, but it'll be 47.7 degrees hotter after that, after it's absorbed 100,000 joules.